Okay, mommy. And now that is in the recording that I'm going to have to delete. <laughs> I, I would leave it. I think you should leave it. Anyway, welcome back, everybody, <laughs> to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. And we are with, I'm Mary Fran Bontempo with my buddy Kristen Smedley, and we are with one of our favorite people who is to blame or thank, we're still not sure which, for putting us together in the first place, our friend Jennifer Gardella. Welcome, Jenny from the block. That's well, thank it, you. We're and so already happy. today, she's like, I don't know if I ever should have brought these two together. <laughs> <laughs> the next show, though, that we just had a brainstorm about, wait do you see that. <laughs> we're just going to, we're going to just give you a hint. It's going to require uh, concealment features <laughs> and drinking. <laughs> we do both Possibly. those things so well. Right. Possibly. And possibly a nun. <laughs> possibly a nun. Right. Don't ask. Okay. So, so I guess what are we in? Week 357 of quarantine. Like. So we are, we are a little bit losing our minds here. So who do we bring on to help us continue to lose our minds? <laughs> Jen Gardella. Two, two of the women who exhaust me more than anybody else on the planet. And I I suggested this. Like, what was I thinking? I was like, yes, because I am having a rotten day. So, yes, let's let's make this a lot lighter around here. Woo. So, anyway, um, as with most people, as with pretty much everybody, our friend Jenny, Dr. Jennifer Gardella, has had her own share of train wrecks and sucker <laughs> punches and unfortunately not too long ago had a major major one um, and it has required her to have to reset rise and reveal her brilliance to the world in different in a different way so we're going to talk about that but first here's the thing first i want to talk about because we never actually talked about this what in the name of all that's good and holy made you think <laughs> that the two of us belonged in a group together because you are responsible for this. We met through a mastermind that you put together and then dropped out of. Okay, wait a minute. You told me that I could drop I did out. Tell you you basically out. said, if you don't drop out, I'm kicking you out. I did say that. So I think that there's always a space <laughs> in the world for phenomenal women to come together on a regular basis. And if you look at any of the great writing that's going on now, accountability and community are what's really helping individuals build their businesses, right? We're laptop life kind of entrepreneurs. We live out of our homes. We work at Starbucks. We, I work at Stacks in Doylestown. Um, and so we don't have an office staff, a, a boss. Like we're each each other's boss. Like we're our own bosses. That's so scary, right? But for Mary Fran, she thinks she's everyone's boss. I am everyone's boss. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> go on with your on. brilliance. Continuing on. So I did have this great idea years ago. I don't even remember when it was. It was definitely 2017, actually. It was either, it was right in that era, time frame um, of bringing together a group of local women that we knew, that I know, who were all trying to build something. And that's what we did. And it was, I remember the first time that I saw a post by Four Chicks Chatting, your podcast, once I had left the group, I was like, wow, like I, I do have some really good ideas. I mean, I know <laughs> I exhaust Mary Fran with my ideas on a regular basis, Oh dear God! <laughs> but there was something very magical about what came out of that group. So there was, there was. and it ended up being, it, it was First of all, the idea in and of itself is something that we all talk about a lot, which is that whole tribe idea. And I think, and the fact that you left or that I kicked you out, basically, is also a valid point in that because the reason I told you you needed to leave is it was the wrong group for you, even though you put it together, because there were six of us at the time when we started, and four of us were in a more similar place than you right. and uh, the other woman, Denise, who left, because you you were just in a different place with your businesses and where you wanted to go and everything, and, and we recognized that fairly quickly into this, and right. I just said to you, you you're not going to get anything out of this. The idea was right, but the mix was not right for you to get what you wanted out of it. Right. And I think 
it's a testament to us as women that we almost survived me leaving because yeah. so many people would be like, oh, why is she leaving? Like, does she think she's better than me? Or, you know, all that stuff that goes We on. knew that you yeah. were better. We just knew. <laughs> we, we did. <laughs> there was no doubt. In fact, when I, when I talked to the other, uh, to the, <laughs> the remaining three about you and Denise, I was like, they're just so much better than we are right now. So they don't belong here because we're just going to drag. <laughs> drag them down in the room then we would have drained you and and i think it's really important to respect when we talk about tribes and we talk about resilience and sharing your brilliance with people i think it's really important to respect where everyone is in that equation right absolutely you know, and, and be willing, like you said, to say, hey, go with God, you know, this is not working for whatever reason. And, and that that was the way that worked out. So anyway, um, you still share your brilliance with the world. And I have to say every single time I see you and I try to go whenever you're speaking nearby or locally or with groups, I try to go because no matter how many times I hear you speak about your brilliance, which is social media for businesses and all of that. Um, and other things, but, but, but I always learned something. Thank you. Well, and I should mention that also in that whole, you built, you brought us together and we developed a tribe out of that. Um, part of your brilliance was also helping me reset in my own journey at the beginning of my divorce journeys when we met and your intervention there and all of your brilliance about resetting and rising after the whole suddenly single, as I call it, was, right. was, um, I almost said detrimental. It was the opposite <laughs> word of detrimental. Beneficial? Beneficial. beneficial. The most beneficial in my journey, you and one other friend of mine that had been down that road already and, and told me the things to do and not do based on your experience was brilliant because Thank you. look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm completely sane and together. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, you got me through do, all of that. You might need to step in and do a little tweaking there. Jen. <laughs> <laughs> so so now tell us about and, and again, you you have a very personal story, um, but it ends up impacting, as most personal stories do, all parts of your life. So take yes. us through your, your sucker punch slash train wreck where you needed to reset. Yeah. So I actually remember, it's so interesting, you know, I had about three seconds to prepare for this. <laughs> You did. Um, <laughs> hey, you want to be on the show? <laughs> I'd like to do next week. Okay, what are you doing at 1.30? Um, I still remember April 12th of 2017 when I was leaving uh, the city of Philadelphia from a conference because I just heard that my ex-husband was diagnosed with a deadly form of cancer. Um, I looked up what he had. I knew uh, in my heart that he was going to die and probably die quickly. And don't get offended, Kristen, but Mary Fran was, I think, the first person I reached out to. I may have texted my husband. I may have texted Danielle or Susan, who you both know. Um, and it was you that I reached out to because of the book that you now have behind you, which wasn't even in existence at that time. And I can remember you said to me, you are now going to start living in 15 minute increments. And I was like, how the hell am I going to survive this? Uh, and unfortunately, 82 days later, John passed away. Hmm. Um, we had, well, we still do have three children together. They're now, at that time, they were 15, 17, and 19. Um, I will tell you that one of, and as we get farther along in our conversation, which I know can't last that long, we could talk all day, <laughs> you know, you look for the gifts. I will never forget turning around at John's wake and seeing the two of you there, Kristen and Mary Fran, Aww. and knowing that I had this tribe of women who were actually willing to drive to New Jersey to having, oh, I don't think ever met John, not being there for my children, but being there for me as the ex-wife, because you guys knew based on your stories and what you have both survived and thrived in, the kind of support that I was going to need. And it was, as we walked through those 82 days, well, we basically just ran through them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. We only had 82 days as he, and he was only he went into the hospital four days after diagnosis. 
and never came out again. I think he came out for a couple hours, but it didn't go well and he went right back in. Um, so it was a struggle. I'm very honest about the shape of my life at that time. My two well, my three children loved him far more than they loved me. So he was the good cop. I was the bad cop. I kind of made it all work. And he was like, oh, look, this is great. Let me take you to get your new iPhone. And I'm like, how the hell are we going to pay for the iPhone? <laughs> you know, and, and that was fine with me. John had my back. I had his. If there were problems with the kids, um, we worked them out together. We had an unbelievable <laughs> amount of peace between the two of us that we both fought for. And I talked about it in my TED Talk, yet another gift of that time. Um, you know, the, the gifts that you can look at from any situation like that. And what I realized very quickly when he got sick was that my two older children, I had to really strengthen those relationships. And I didn't have time to do it before he died. And all of a sudden, he was gone. And I was like, I remember sitting upstairs in my master bedroom. I had just gotten the call that he was gone. And I was like, who the hell is going to tell the kids? And who the hell's now going to parent them? Hmm. Like, what? Yeah. Like, All the I know, time. I, I now have to, and my older daughter was not living with us. She was also not talking with us. My middle child, Vicky, um, was his best, he was her best buddy in the whole world. And Steffi, the little one, kind of floated in between, and she was fine, but she was really young and emotionally now dealing with the death of her father. And what got lost in And that whole process catastrophic to their life is well I got lost and that's what I've really been working on since you know it was one thing to carry my children through because I had to and get them the help that they needed I went through this period of oh well it's just my ex-husband and I allowed other people to say that hmm. and that was a big problem because I did lose someone who was closer to me than a brother is we have three children together now I will also share all jokes aside John and I now have the best relationship ever. <laughs> it's, it's very easy you to have a You should explain that. <laughs> yeah. So when you lose somebody and, you know, Kristen, I know that you've gone through a divorce and I thank you for, you know, I, I, John and I did receive quite a number of compliments that people have modeled their divorces after ours because we were friends. Like, what's the point of fighting with each other? Yeah. Um, but once he was gone, I realized so quickly that it was my job here on earth to parent for both of us. And he had actually told his girlfriend that right before he died. Jen's got this because he didn't want to talk about it. He knew he was going, I guess. Um, hmm. And he's like, Jen's got it. And I do for both of us. There are so many times when I look at my girls, when they ask me something and I'm like, Ugh, he would let you do it. <laughs> I would never let you do it. He would let you do it. Or, you know, and I does that does that factor in then to your decisions about what you let them do and not do? Absolutely. They are not in any way my children alone to parent. And I think that is one thing that they really appreciate as kids. You know, when I can say, look, I know that dad would let you go to the Firefly Music Festival. Hmm. I would never, never. but I'm going to allow it. And, you know, his, John's girlfriend called me like, you will let her go to the firefight. Like that would have been a war between you and John. <laughs> and so, but I am, and I'm able to, you know, and, and I jokingly say, John speaks to me, you know, do this for her. You need, to, you need to do this, or you need to buy the prom dress that's too expensive. Or you, and I can look at my kids and say, dad's telling me to do it. So did you guys start out that way in your divorce journey with we decided having to each other's back? Yeah, we did. Um, it was, we decided to split in March of 2010. And by Mother's Day, by the spring concerts at school, we were there. Uh, I tell the story often. It's in my book that I don't know if I'll ever finish. And in my TED Talk, uh, John, we were attending a concert together for our middle daughter at the element at the middle school. And he texts, I said, I texted him and I said, I've saved you a spot. And he texted back and he said, I don't have to sit with you anymore. And I texted him and said, our daughter is going to look down on the state from the stage and needs to see her family sitting together. Hmm. And from that moment, swim meets, concerts, graduations we parented together and everyone thinks you know oh isn't that great they had peace it wasn't easy all the time I mean yeah there's a point when you look at the other person and you're like you know what we divorced for reason a for reason, a lot of yeah. reasons I yeah. don't really want to be sitting next to you yeah. um at any time and 
it wasn't all like a perfect relationship. I mean, we did struggle at times in dealing with each other and then had to go to the swim meet like, hi, how are you? Um, but we had a lot of the same friends. Uh, we both went to Fordham. So, and we had grown up in our adult life together. So that was a really big piece of our story too. You know, how, how's this friend? How's that person? They're having another kid. They're getting whatever, you know, it was really, it, we made it easier. And I learned that from you, from that story that you told me about, they have to you have to sit together at the um, sports and all of that stuff. I lost, I lost quite a bit of weight. That was a good weight <laughs> loss tip. <laughs> Everyone having does. to do that. Everyone First, then does. mine, mine, he, he got sick in a different way. But you, you have to have two people who, who are willing to cooperate in that. And not everybody has that, Kristen. You didn't have that all the way through and you don't have that. So, yeah, you know, it, it is a two way street, but, but Jen, you, I mean, gosh, talk about resilience. <laughs> In I two mean, ways, right? Resilient really? from a divorce and really making the best of it. And then how am I going to factor him into the parenting of our kids? And I will share, a lot more people had problems with the way that John and I acted than John and I did. At his funeral, I wanted his best friends to actually meet my husband because Dave and I were going to be raising the children yeah. John's children mm -hmm. were going to be raised by someone else that John actually really respected. John was able, willing to come into our home and shake Dave's hand. And Dave was open to that. Um, and they had their moment, which I also have talked about enough. Um, but a lot of John's friends were like, I don't want to meet your husband. And I was like, wait, you're totally missing it here. Yeah. My kids still need you and need John. And this is the guy that's going to be moving them into college dorms. Yeah. Like, right. Right. This is all really crazy. Yeah. So, but you had to be resilient, not only for the girls, but obviously that took precedence because you and I have had this conversation many, 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 many times at this point, everything else at not this point currently, but the point at which you were at, everything else had to take a back seat. And that includes your own, I mean, your business suffered, your, you know, your personal identity goes through all these changes and you put that aside for a period of time until you got your girls straightened out. So you need it. And then you need to go back and find right. resilience for you. Right. I had made a decision as you did with your son and certainly Kristen, as you did with your boys, you know, I knew that putting the right support in place for my girls would pay dividends in the future. Mm -hmm. You need to put them in rehab. You need yes. to teach them to walk with the cane. Yes. You need to teach, you need to take that step back and it almost, which then strengthen or at least prevent us from having to deal with disasters in the future. I mean, when kids are in this situation and don't get the help that they need, they go right off the edge. And I was not going to let that happen. Yeah. You, I mean, so here's, here's a, for, for people that are listening, because I know uh, friends of mine, I know people that are in this group um, that have much in, in their minds and probably very real to different divorce journeys and different journeys in terms of having a difficult family member, right? So the stuff that you're saying about, yeah, and then we, you know, had to sit and, and, and work this out between us. Here's what I learned from you because I didn't have that on the other side of with my relationship. I at least was able to um, do the things that you did in, in with my kids in terms of I didn't talk bad, not talking bad about the other person, not being judgmental, listening, not having any judgment, just listening when they would come and still come and, and want to unload those kinds of things. Almost like the other person is still healthy and, and cooperative. So I'm not saying anything and just letting, and that for my kids has made them so healthy and, yep. and resilient themselves because it's not it's not this horrible thing I remember you said to me one time about you don't want them in the feeling like they're bouncing between this war oh god because no. it destroys them it does so just having the, even that so those of you that are listening and think I could never come to to that with that family member that whatever as long as you are one person in that equation that is acting in a healthy way and and being productive then the kids do end up bouncing back and, and being resilient. And they learn about how to, how to have their own relationship with that person. Yeah. And also, you know, and I, I say it in my TED talk, I mean, if God forbid something is to happen to you as a divorced parent, 
it is your former spouse that holds your bag of memories. Everybody mm -hmm. else goes away. <laughs> My friend Debbie from Safe Harbor, which we may talk about, you know, she talks about the 15 minutes of fame. Everyone's around you and it's great. And we're going to cook you casseroles and we're going to take your kids. Away. And then you know what they do? They go right back to their lives. And I'm left. What's the best thing for my kids? For me to remember their dad, whether it's in their mannerisms, their pictures, their however it is. And that would be very awkward if John and I didn't have a lot of peace because yeah. he's yeah. all over my house. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a piece of it too. You know, what I also found interesting, so we, we, you know, the reset part is where we talk about the sucker punch and all that, but, but the, the rising started almost immediately with you because you had to be on this with your girls right away. But what I have always thought was interesting about your journey was as you then felt that they were more grounded and that they were okay and turned some of your attention to yourself, the strength and the the foundation that you gave them allowed you to say to them at various times, I'm just trying to figure this out. I don't necessarily know what the heck I'm doing. And they were very supportive of you in that because you gave them that skill. Right. You gave them that skill to say, you know, like, we're going to figure this out. Like when all this first happened, we're going to figure this out. We're going to get through it together. And of course, you know, you're flying by the seat of your pants because you don't know how you're going to figure it out. You're just like, okay. yeah, I'm saying the words, but I don't know how this is going to play out. But then you did that. It was almost like the fake it till we make it kind of thing. Oh, and yeah. then when you had to go back and go, all right, now I got to fix this hot mess because this is a mess now, the, your girls turned into a support network for you, which was amazing to me. <laughs> Yeah, they really are. You know, they are, well, now they're a little bit older. And a lot of the questions that I think they didn't even know they had have been answered. How are we going to go to college? Like Vicky, my middle one, was right in the middle of the college process as a junior, as uh, it was the summer between her junior and senior year. John loved all that college stuff. And I made no bones about the fact that I hated it. <laughs> and all of a sudden she's like um mom i need to write a college essay and eventually it was hey i got into vermont and pittsburgh and i'd like to go see them both and i'm like i'm not just gonna do that <laughs> <laughs> like who the hell's gonna drive you out to vermont and, oh and they're both in the same week you know and and i think it was my girls watching me say yes and build a support system and then they knew when I had to say no to them. And I also built an unbelievable support system for them. And one of the best stories that I have out of that time, and it was a note that I actually have to talk to you guys, you know, in the 30 seconds that I had to prepare for this, my kids learned how to get help. And how many times in our lives mm -hmm. have we said, I don't want to go to a therapist or I don't want anyone to know my problems. And one of the ways that John was, John and I were a parenting team is when my kids thought I was too strict or they were scared to death of me, they would go to their dad. That was an enormous piece of support that was taken away from them when he was gone. Mm. For Steffi, that person became Tanya Dur Barone Durant, her guidance counselor at CB East, Central Bucks uh, East High School. Talk about the guidance counselors all you want. I had an amazing experience with this woman who would call me about the craziest things. Like, <laughs> Steffi does not want to go on the family trip to Disney World because she wants to go to cheer practice. Like that, like she really stepped in for us wow. and was unbelievably help, helpful to the point where when Steffi was graduating, the guidance counselor not only came, but sought me out on the field afterwards and was like, we got her through. I'm like, we got her through. Yeah. You know? So, and my kids know, my, my daughters know that, you know, if they need help to seek it out, Steffi went into Safe Harbor, which is a program for um, kids who lost a loved one, typically a parent to, uh, well, just lost. Yeah, just a parent died. Um, and we went every Wednesday. And something not a lot of people know about me is I really am not a big fan of like driving around a lot. And she knew, like, I I'm fine staying in my house right now. Like, I'm not having any problems with it at all, like everyone else's. But she knew that if I was putting the commitment into taking her to that program every other week, it was really flipping important. And she got all of the help that she needed at that time. I mean, that was an amazing, but my girls, one of my other two needed a therapist this week, this, um, I'm sorry, this year at school. And it was, 
a drop everything and run kind of experience for me because I needed to find them help. They know to reach out and ask for that. They can go to a college professor. They can go, you know, there's a lot of different support systems that they've then put in place for themselves. And that was one of the best lessons I think that they got out of that situation. Well, that's huge. We just talked to Tiffany Smiley last week, who has the More Than Me women's group, and, and um, she's a speaker all over the country, and she has her um, system of resilience, and one of her key points is know to raise your hand and ask for help, because that changed her life. That's when she started her rise, when she because she took care of everybody else, Yeah. And but she was, what, in her mid-late 30s, um, when she finally said, wait a minute, I have to ask for help, so gosh, arming your kids with that tool before they're out in the world on their own is, is probably going to be one of their biggest um, uh, indicators for success because how long did it take yeah. all of us, you know? Yeah. Right. And yeah. my girls also, last year, you know, I share a lot. Um, you know, I, I can't say that I was depressed, but I knew that I hadn't handled John's death internally for me. Like I said, oh, he was just my ex-husband. No, actually I lost a friend. And I started working with the possibility coaches there in Buckingham, Pennsylvania, John Satin, um, great guy. And I, my kids knew Monday at 11 o'clock, mom's not available. She's with her therapist. Well, John doesn't like the word therapist, so we'll call him a coach. But you know, mom, mom's working stuff out because I needed a lot of help. Like, how was I going to rebuild this business in a hypersaturated market when what I had done to start it was not going to work for me anymore? Number one, I didn't have that much energy, nor did I want to do that again. But and now, look at where we are. We're in a world where we are we can't even go networking. Right. Yeah. So you really do need to be able, and that's one of the things that the possibility coaches you know, really helped me see to be able to pivot. Like it's yep. not working. So what is this teaching you? What are the skills? So my kids know that I've seen someone and I definitely grew up in a world where therapy was not cool. You know, like don't tell anybody else your problems. And now I'm like everybody on the therapy bus. <laughs> yeah. That's me. Well, when I was first <laughs> going to therapy, when all my hair fell out and things weren't going so well, <laughs> I had to first get extensions and second, I had I to go to a that. therapist, right? So, and I was telling my kids, oh my God, I, this was another one of those moments that I was so close to the mother of the year trophy and then it was ripped away. <laughs> oh yeah. I said, I was telling them I was, I had a doctor's appointment and then after like two months, I wanted them to go to therapy because uh, they really were needing it. And I was like, oh my God, you guys, I, I have been saying doctor's appointment, I've been going to a therapist and they were like, you're kidding. And I'm like, what is the matter with me? Cause they're like, we don't want to go to a therapist. I'm like, why I have been, I just haven't been telling you something <laughs> wrong with me. But because we grew up in that, in that whole mindset of, ah, now I'm like, woo, let's line up all the therapists for me. Clearly I need a million. Yeah, you know? next. But I yeah. said to them after I had, I said, look how much better I'm doing and look how, you know, this and that and, and all these strategies, that's because she helped me with that. And that's what you can learn too. Of course. Yeah. And I've also taught my girls, you know, like the therapist led me down a path, which was then I was able to say, okay, what's wrong with my business and where am I going to get the help from? And I started down, um, I talk about this all the time. And whenever I have a great idea, I call Mary Fran and, you know, she has to do a shot of tequila or something. <laughs> like totally had it with me but I'm like oh, right. oh my gosh we've got to read this book and it's EOS. Yeah, there's always a we there's always a we attached to her great always. ideas always but we've got to read this book it's called educational um, entrepreneurial operating system and Amy Porterfield is using it and it's about values and she's like oh dear god what is she up to now <laughs> but I was able to say you know what I need help with my business like people look at me mm -hmm. right they look at my website they look at my blog they look at Huffington Post and I have a TED talk and I have clients and it's this great and I'm like no, <laughs> no, it is no, it is a hot mess to great success, which is then the name of my podcast. Which, you know, and and so people look at all this and they're like, "Wow, Jen's awesome!" And I'm like, "No, Jen has a lot to rebuild." And then that led me. I don't think Mary Fran knows about this one yet, but oh it's led Let me to. Sit. Yeah, so EOS led me to really structure my business in a different way. Then a program called Lifebook, which is run by Mind Valley, has helped me look at the 12 areas of my life and say, oh my God, like I've never been encouraged in any way, shape, or form to look at my life this way and say, there's nothing wrong with saying, I need to fix a whole lot of stuff. 
Well, and I think, you know, you and I, before we got on this, this particular call, you and I had a conversation earlier today, and I was talking to you about how Chris and I have seen the idea of people's values and what's important to them and all this other stuff runs like a current through everybody who has who has gone through something, risen above it, and then gone on to bring their brilliance out into the world. And that's what, like everything about your journey, and I'm glad you, you pivoted to talk about your business because I wanted to do that, because everything about your journey has ultimately led you to also to find ways to, to build your business back up again and to better yeah. serve your clients and all of that stuff because you're working from a place of, of integrity and values. And helping others. And that's right. where Lifebook really helped me in these last couple of weeks. And EOS does take you there to an extent. But Lifebook says, you know, like, who are you helping? And John Satin of the Possibility Coaches says to himself every morning, I'm open for business. Who can I help? And I will share because as Mary Fran, you know, because you're listening to my telesummit right now, which the first video was recorded out of my master bedroom closet because no one in my house could be quiet at the time. Which is hilarious. <laughs> That's why I'm recording to, my audio version of my book. You have to go on this just to see, just to see the inside of Jen's closet. It's but awesome. When this disaster hit a couple of weeks ago and I saw everybody going into their houses, I thought to myself, knee jerk reaction, oh my God, I'm not ready. My courses aren't ready. Your social media hour isn't ready. I'm going to miss another opportunity to make money. Mm. Talk about being honest, right? I mean, that was mm -hmm. my knee-jerk reaction. And then I went, hold on. This is going to teach you to help. Mm -hmm. Detach emotionally, Mary Fran, yep. from mm -hmm. the outcome of riches, fame, and fortune, and just get down and dirty and tactical and help people. And that's why, you know, everyone's like, oh yeah, of course Jenna started her own telesummit. When it's just me getting on the on, on video every day with a couple of handouts telling people what to do. And we all know I love to tell people. What to do, but, <laughs> I mean, that's like no secret here, but it is that helping. And, you know, everyone's like, you should be charging and you should be. And I'm like, no, I, not right I, now. most of my ideal clients, some of my actual clients I know are not going to be able to pay their bills soon. So right. the more I think that we help each other, that helping eventually, now it has to lead to compensation at some point and we all have to be compensated for what we do. But I made a very strong pivot very quickly and I said, no, I'm going to help people build a digital foundation so that they come out of this time besides with a pair of favorite sweatpants that they've worn every day for a month without washing <laughs> or maybe washing intermittently. <laughs> Kristen's going to own that one right away. Hey. But besides that and, you know, 10 extra pounds from eating all your quarantine snacks as you buy, <laughs> as quickly as you buy them, come out with a series of blogs and videos and links and all of these other great things so that your business actually can thrive in whatever this new environment is going to look like. And so that's where I've pivoted my business. But when John Satin told me that last year, he's like, no, it's all about helping people. I was like, it's all about money. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, it's really not. And so I have been corresponding with him saying, oh my God, you won't believe this. You were right. He goes, oh, I know. Well, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's a hard lesson for us to learn. I mean, especially those of us who have struggled to make money in, mm -hmm. in terms of being an entrepreneur and, and everyone who has ever been an entrepreneur has. Um, but once you do that mental shift, first of all, it clears the way for you to do your best work. Oh, yeah. Because oh, when you're yeah. not obsessing about that, you're putting the energy into the content, which ultimately ends up bringing you business down the road. But it's a longer process. So we have to get rid of that, you know, need it now. I want it now kind of thing. And not, again, as you said, not be married to the outcome and put the work in and, and build it. And, and it's just... First of all, just thank you for coming and joining us today. You know I'm the clock watcher, so we got to wind down here soon. I but, thought we um, were moving to cocktails. I would. Oh, don't tempt me. <laughs> I could hey, probably... don't we have an open slot for a happy hour on Friday? I think we do. Would you like to come back? <laughs> you can. You can record from your closet. I'd love to see it. <laughs> Hold on, let me check my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, your journey has been in the time that I've I've known you. First of all, you're one of the smartest people I know. <laughs> You're incredibly generous in terms of sharing your knowledge with people. And that personal journey that you were on, just watching you go through that with such grace and dignity and come out the other side. Um, Kristen says, you don't want to come out. You want to come out the other side, not broken, but brilliant. But you were partially broken during the period, oh. as we all are during those in periods during those things. But you didn't stay that way. 
Well, remember though, I mean, I also had you guys, I could call you Mary Fran crying and you can sit there and say, this is another 15 minutes. That's just going to have to pass. Yeah. And sometimes it's to make it to the next 15 minutes and sometimes of crap that you're going to have to go through. And sometimes the 15 minute passes and then it's over and then it's better. And so yeah. it's critical to find people like you guys that you know, as I always say, like I have a friend that's going through a divorce right now. I have friends that are losing, that just lost spouses and, you know, find your list of 10 people because inevitably you'll exhaust everybody on the first five and you'll have to still <laughs> keep talking. And I had that. You guys might not know that, but I had that, right? Oh, that's so perfect. Have that list of 10. And unfortunately, Mary Fran was at the top because you've been so generous in sharing your story. And so I would naturally gravitate to you because I'm like, well, if she can survive a kid addicted to drugs, I can somehow get my family through this one. Well, she snapped your face right back into perspective. It's like, <laughs> look. So she'll, she'll, the thing with Mary Fran is that she knows when it's time to give you that 15 minutes to cry it out. And she also knows like when I was going up for my TED talk and, and goofball is all over breathing down my neck and I'm standing in the kitchen with the three kids and we're about to go up to New York city. I'm like, what is, yeah. all of a sudden, I'm like, what is the matter with me? Oh my God. And she's like, snap out of it. <laughs> You've got a job to do. You're going to take those kids to New York. You're going to do all that. And I was like, all right then. Whereas everybody else was like, what are you nuts? You're doing all that going zigzag in the city, doing a TED talk. She was like, you know, it. you know, you gotta, you, you it, you're exactly right though. You have to be able, you, it is. You, and I don't ever tell anybody, oh, just, just get over the emotion. You can't just get over the emotion. You have to experience the emotion, but then you have to not live there. And, and you are both examples of exactly that. Of course, you're going to experience those lows and those terrible, awful periods but then we reach out we help each other up we lift each other up and and somebody says to you okay that's enough that's enough right. and to move forward with integrity you know just to share one more story I remember when my kids were graduating from high school and college last year and I don't have a great relationship with my ex-husband's family that's their choice but the question was do I invite him to dinner like do I invite him to the ceremony do I pay for dinner and you know what does good old MFB say if you're yeah, asking yeah. the question, you already know the answer. You know the yeah. answer. Get yeah. out your credit card. Guess who you're taking to dinner? <laughs> Guess who you're taking to dinner? <laughs> That's and what I next was like. <laughs> I am. I am rapidly being put in the category of everybody who's listening. Of I don't want to be her friend. <laughs> No, uh -huh. you need that friend in your tribe. They're all going to say, she's going to tell me what I have to do, and I'm not going to like it. <laughs> we always I, say that about one of my best friends who I met at college orientation. We are still best friends, Stacy. We were just, the last time she was here, we were talking about how she is the one friend that when we were in college, you knew to go to Stacy if you wanted to know if you look like an idiot in the clothes you chose. <laughs> And she would go, get that off. Or that looks great. Because she was so honest. Yeah. And she's honest with everything that she tells. And I think that, that you have to have, you got to have the honest people in your tribe. And you have to have the ones that are going to hold your hand and let you cry on their shoulder. But if you don't have the honest one, you're going to stay stuck in that yeah. spot. Right. And yeah, I have both. my best friend, Danielle, who I talk to three or four times a day. And we're like two kids playing in a sandbox together sometimes. And then I have MFB who's like, what do I do? And she goes, you know what to do. Just do the right thing. <laughs> Just do the, do the right thing. thing. Now stop put, texting me 75 times. <laughs> you, put, you put yourself in this situation. I got to go make Play-Doh with my grandkids. And, and you absolutely know what to do. I got to make Play-Doh with my grandkids. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. She's texting me and I'm making Play-Doh characters. I'm like, oh, you need to be it. doing a video for your business. Randy I has can't. to talk to her friend. <laughs> okay, here's the Play-Doh thing. <laughs> or we're building our courses online together and she's literally has a baby saddled on her chest. <laughs> like, I did. That was so funny. But we all did right, this whole launch. How about we did the launch last week? And I'm like, oh my God, Mary friend, when you're doing that press release and we should also do this and I'm texting and then we should probably do this. And she goes, how many freaking things do you think I can do at once? <laughs> Yet I think most of them are done by now. Anyway, tell everybody where we can find you. 
So, some of your brilliance. Yes, so uh, jennifergardella.com is my main website. I do blogging and social media for small business owners. Uh, there's two important things there right now in the top navigation menu. There is my telesummit where I'm coming to people a couple times every week with real tactical get this done kind of instruction. So it's not the let me talk about myself for an hour and then tell you, you know, you need a LinkedIn account. I actually go in there and tell you how to do it. Um, and then the other thing is book a call with me. If anybody out there is struggling with their digital marketing presence right now, please book a call. I've talked to million dollar businesses who have had to shutter their doors um, and are not making any money and will not until people are allowed to go in the store again. And I've talked to business coaches who have a shot at doing something, but don't know what to do right now and how to promote themselves. So all fair game. I'm really here to help. And then I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as, as the Gardella group. So and I can attest to the fact that you are brilliant in all of those areas and have helped me more than I can possibly say. So thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you for enjoying joining us today. It was a great conversation. So much fun. It was so fun. And please, Jen, text Mary Fran several times an hour. It'll make me look so much better. <laughs> Thanks That's for it. joining us, everybody. That's it. We'll see you next time on Brilliantly Resilient Live. Bye, guys. Bye.